Welcome back, everybody, gentle listeners, gentle viewers, if you're on YouTube, for another conversation with the legendary strength coach, according to Men's Health Magazine, Daniel John. Always great to see you, Dan. Cheers. Good morning. Thank you, and good morning, and cheers. A delicious cup of coffee. Uh, it's from our annual Polar Express that we go on with the kids and the grandkids, and very exciting. Uh, it probably won't do that this year. Uh, which is just one more sad thing to, to say, but uh, hey, good morning to you. Uh, and I hope that our conversation can bring some light to people who are facing the reality that this isn't gonna just disappear by, I called uh, Elizabeth Montgomery from Bewitched. I had her wrinkle her nose and uh, I think we're, uh, we're struggling here, aren't we a little bit? Yeah, sorry, there's a little bit of lag. We'll uh, see if this clears up in a minute. If not, I'll just kill the video and people will have to miss out on this wonderful complexion. Um, Dan, you've been on a couple of podcasts recently. I had a friend of mine shoot me a text the other day and he's like, I feel I kind of know famous people because I he listens to the Art of the, Art of the Manliness podcast. Yeah. And uh, he heard your episode, loved it. Uh, you talked about pirate maps, and uh, he was very excited to deliver that news to me. So, yeah, update us. What have uh, what's been going on in the world of Dan John? You do well, a lot of podcasts, a lot of interviews. Mm -hmm. I was this weekend. I actually did travel. I went to one of our military bases, and uh, I spent some quality time with the with the fine people who uh, uh, volunteer their there's their lives in many cases people i work with and uh, i did come away with an interesting piece of information i gotta i gotta thank the the, the i gotta, can't give you too much information but these the, the people who work with those people is that um you know there's cramps that you get from dehydration and so those are hydration can uh cramps but there's also a kind of cramp that's called uh, actually a nerve bundle cramp and that's probably the kind of cramps that I deal with most, not only personally, but with the athletes I deal with. Like if you're doing uh, hang snatches or lots and lots of kettlebell uh, swings and you get that weird cramp in the back of your hammy. Hopefully it's in the back of your hammy, folks. If it's in your back, put the bell down and come see me. You're swinging wrong. Uh, if, and uh, not long ago, in fact, I remember, I thought I blew a muscle up uh, on my uh, hammy but it was just this, and here's the cure for it, hot sauce. Well, I'll be. A shot, a shot of hot sauce. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Nope. And there's good research on it. And so one of the things I'm going to start. <laughs> Wait, say, does, man, uh, I, so obviously I'm curious, does the brand matter? Can it be Tabasco's? Does it have to be Melinda's? Or what's the secret formula it, here? It has to have uh Capsicum in it. Cap if Capsicum. I say it, wrong. If, if that you know the word I'm using. That's the key, and I guess it. Uh, I guess they travel the same uh, uh, neural pathways, and the hot sauce tells uh, tells the the brain, "Hey, it's easy. We're good. We're good." You know. Uh, so hot I, sauce, hot sauce for food. muscle cramps. I mean, that's a totally testable hypothesis. I've got tons of hot sauce here. Next time I'm cramping up, I'll go take a shot of it. <laughs> now you have to stop what you're doing. So if it's if you're in the middle of a set, a kettlebell swing, you can't keep swinging. You know, you're gonna stop. But uh, uh, when she said that, it was like one of those moments where I went, "Oh, okay," because I think I have had as a football player dehydration cramps. So I knew what she meant. I know those. But since probably football wrestling, I haven't had those, but I still cramp. But what I get is I get hot sauce cramps. Um, so my gym now, I'm going to have a bottle. Of, uh, I mean, it's gonna be weird. Bottle of whiskey, bottle of hot sauce, some of that uh, sheet, the, the, the hand uh, lotion, um, the, the good hand lotion I have, uh, the sheep stuff, and a ball of tape. I mean, this is just, you know, I'm getting. I mean, we're up to four things now in my in the first aid kit. I was going to say that's a that's a real med kit you have there, Dan. That's utterly fascinating. Well, it, yeah, I like hot sauce, so it's yeah, not the, it's not the worst remedy in the world, as far as I'm not concerned. even a little bit. And the, the nice thing I thought is this was easy, it was doable, and at some level, I mean, uh, I mean, 
I, I'd much rather go in for, you know, it's like, the, oh, I, by the way, I have a new batch of sauerkraut. I just finished it. But, you know, if someone, when, <clears throat> when I find out that uh, eating more sauerkraut and eating more fruit might be as good for you, for, for your body as, well, all kinds of other things. I was like, well, okay, whole food, you know, uh, a, you know, right off the table kind of thing. I, I like that idea. I, I hope gentle listeners don't think I'm some kind of like hippie or anything. Um, but uh, yeah, if the answer is, if the answer to me is logical and in front of you and I mean, drinking a, drinking a little hit of hot sauce to cure a cramp, even if it doesn't work, at least I'm not, you know, I'm not taking a pill when I watch the Sunday morning news. <laughs> Only two countries in the, in the world allow uh, prescription medicines to be advertised. Well, and of course, we're one of them. My favorite part of prescription things is this. Do not take this if you are pregnant or lactating or have ever been close to another human being. Do not. This can lead to vomitous diarrhea. Mm -hmm. This can lead from... And then they just start going through all those things. And it's like, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah I, until, until they get to untimely death. Um, untimely that's always death. the one where... You are more where, likely yeah. to be struck by a hurricane. Uh, yeah, uh, it is. Uh, yeah, it's a little... Uh, yeah. So the nice thing is, if I take a shot of hot sauce, I kind of know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, being Irish, it means I'm going to go... If, oh, if, oh, yeah, and if nothing else, you you clear the sinuses, right? That, that's almost always a guarantee for me. And this morning, I need that, I guess. Jeez, that's the... Yeah, a little, a little stuffy this morning. Hey, let's talk about the kettlebell swing a little bit more, Dan. What are um, what are three things that people typically get wrong? You could do more than three if you want when they first start well, swinging. Well, it's yeah. been a while since we've gone back to basics on this one. I think it might be worth well, revisiting. To me, number one, and, and I can't believe... It, there, there's two sides to one and two uh, could be two and one it, it won't the order won't matter but i always say the vertical plank and then w- when i was demonstrating this weekend to the group uh i showed them the position of so i believe when you finish the swing the top of your head should be driving towards zenith to vertical that your butt should be as tight as it possibly can your quad should be tight uh your feet should grip the ground well if you lean back, you destroy all of that. So that's why I like, I prefer a much lower kettlebell swing height at the, at, at the vertical plank position than a lot of people, because my thought is it's far more important long-term to not bend that back, you know, not get into that car crash position where your back's going straight. So for me, it's, Grabbing the bell, I'm going to say with my lats, folks, and I apologize because that, that does kind of come off as kettlebell ease. But when that bell, when that bell, when I'm at vertical, I'm grabbing the bell, squeezing with my hands, I'm grabbing my lats. And then number two, the second issue, throw it at your zipper. Throw it at your zipper, your zipper, your zipper. I use other terms when I'm with the military. Um, and the idea is that a low bell. Uh, now we always talk at the certs; it's got to go between the zipper and the knees. But I like aiming for the zipper because that will guarantee that the person will get out of the way. And, right. and really, it's going to be a little bit lower. And if the person makes that, you know, doesn't get out of the way, well, the gene pool needs to be cleared out sometimes too. All right. So, there's other things we we need to be working on at that point. Right. So vertical plank, hinging appropriately. Oh, and, and if you don't mind, the third one uh, is, is, is you put the bell down when it's time to put the bell down. Uh, and I would say after a bad rep, uh, if, if you feel your fingers sliding, bell down, uh, wipe, you know, put your hands on your shirt, go again. Uh, if you feel that uh, someone said something, you lost uh, uh, focus for a moment, put the bell down. Your, your favorite song comes on, your, your, your jam. Like for me, I would say probably Twilight by Mary McPartland, you know, um, the number of listeners who just caught that is, is probably just me. Uh, but, uh, you know, put the bell down, listen to your jam, go back. Uh, so, and it's not that I'm a safety Nazi or anything like that. It's just that I'm, I'm a big believer that if you're doing what I consider 
one of the most ballistic exercises we can do in training. And, and I, and I'm going to stand by that. You, people are going to send in some stupid answers and I'll, and I'll, and then I'll, I'll do what uh, those two guys do. You know, who are the, they, they fly around, they punch people. Um, come on, Bob, silent Bob and uh, Jay and silent Bob. Jay and silent Bob, they fly around when people make fun of them on the internet and punch them. I'm going to do that. Okay. Uh, but uh, I honestly think that it's not just for safety sakes. One and two isn't just for safety. It's for performance sake. Um, and don't forget, like, like I, always, <clears throat> I said in that little workshop I did on kettlebells, um, it, it's available on YouTube, the 15 minute version. And then the hour version is on. And by the way, all the secrets are on the 15 minute version. The hour just has more. Um, uh, I think if we went out on a field right now and started throwing the discus, I would be the safest person throwing the discus because my per performance is the best. So I like to always link together performance and safety. So the better you perform, the safer you probably are. Mm -hmm. I've never been hurt on a missed attempt. Right, right. Yeah. So we don't have to put uh, safety and performance at odds. I think that's always a, a fantastic and important reminder. All right, moving from the swing, we'll just we'll just stick to some of the basics today. I think this is this is really good. Let's go to an exercise, Dan, that you're definitely familiar with, the old goblet squat. Um, oh, you, you know a thing or two about that. What are the what are the three common mistakes that people make there? Well, one, two, and three are all the same thing. Uh, they 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 think it's a squat. I mean, check that. They think it's an up and down thing. But the truth is what the goblet squat is, is taking your right elbow and pushing your right knee out, taking your left elbow and pushing your left knee out, spreading the knees for a moment, bringing your chest up nice and proud to make your lower back. Or, you know, I mean, if you can set your lower back by setting your lower back, you're a better man than I. But big Mr. Universe chest, that pause with that pause is the goblet squat. So what a lot of people do, and I, I saw a video on this, uh, it's on a thing called the Instagrams, and uh, the guy's doing goblet squats and he tagged me and his knees, there's probably a one foot or greater gap between his knees and his elbows. It, that's how undeep he goes. Uh, shallow, I guess, would be a better word to use, but it's early. That's how shallow he goes. And he missed the whole concept of what the goblet squat does, is that the goblet squat teaches you that you're not built on top of your legs, your body slides between your legs. Um, the, uh, so if you don't mind, um, yeah, here are the three keys. Elbows push out the knees, uh, big, the pause with the big chest, and then um, if you can, teach yourself to stand up uh, keeping that whatever angle your back is at try to stand up at the same angle all the way you know uh it would be nice if it was sort of more vertical doesn't have to be perfectly vertical obviously but try to stand up hold it so don't don't come halfway up uh bow and then keep going yeah try to try to be one piece that's that's, Not, it. that's good I like that. No, I mean, it's, it's all about those, those simple cues that are easy to visualize and, and just spreading your knees with your elbows, I think is, is it, I mean, that's, that's, it's the magic cue. Um, I, by the way, um, and don't underestimate the goblet squat friends. I mean, I do a lot of front squats. I do a good amount of, of the, of, of the barbell, the heavier squats, but the other day, Dan, I took one of your routines, the uh, eight reps on the minute, every minute with the goblet squat and it tore me up, tore me up. Um, felt great though, too. You know, just, there's something about the goblet squat that you don't get with the barbell squats that, that, that really just, you know, even after I do the heavier barbell squats, it feels good, but I'm always, I don't know. And maybe it's just as I increase in decrepitude, um, this is just an issue, but the goblet squats don't do that for me. The goblet squats give me a great workout and I always feel more rejuvenated and loosened. I've by noticed that, that exercise. you know, I'm getting ready for this Olympic lifting meet and I can't. I don't remember how I, I don't remember how I used to Olympic lift in the past without it. Um, I, I've noticed that I, I use it as, I, I guess you'd call it the warm up, but you know, I, I'm starting now to use it even in between sets of squat snatches to remind myself what a squat's supposed to do. Cause you know, when you whip the bar up over your head, 
and I'm not using huge pounds. I mean, I think, I think one one fifty five yesterday. I mean, that's it's, it's nothing. But um, <clears throat> you know, when I get down at the bottom with the barbell over my head at age sixty three, I have to okay, I put the weight down and then I'll do a goblet squat and go, that's Danny, this is the position you want to get to. But with the bar overhead, what, you know, bar fear, uh, flexibility, whatever, uh, too much noise. Um, so yeah, you're right. Uh, come back to the goblet squat as a, uh, as a reminder is, is I, I, I don't disagree with you. And I don't think people have really uh, like you, I like that workout eight reps on the minute, uh, you know, for three hours, that's a good workout. For three you, hours, yeah, totally reasonable. You totally, very, very efficient. Um, but I tell you one thing: at the end of that, uh, if you do it, the only problem. I mean, if you did ten rounds of that, that'd be brutal. Five but, rounds, five but, rounds is 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 going to be enough for most people. That um, I mean, eight rounds is especially gruesome, and you don't have to go heavy. I mean, I just I just did twenty four kilogram. Oh, that's all you need, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing about that is that that is a squat workout. That's probably going to make you, I mean, you'll, you, you might get sore, I don't know, but the nice thing is that when you slide over back into real life, the tonic and mobility and the flexibility work of that, plus the volume is probably going to, I don't want to say, well, maybe probably better than a lot of other stuff. Remember folks, it's the movement of squatting we want you to do every day, not right. necessarily the, the, the load. Yeah, I like it as um, a lot of prep work you do with the goblet squat. I'm I'm going to start doing that more at the end of, of my routines where I do the heavier squatting just because it just felt good, Dan. Good. Felt good. good. And it's easy It's easy to overlook um, those simple basic exercises and forget how useful they are. Even for me, I have to remind myself. Let's get back to the goblet squats. Um, here's another question for you. Um, this is one that I get fairly often. I'm sure you get it as well. When do you move somebody on, if you move them on at all, from the single kettlebells to the double kettlebells? I remember back in the old days, Dan, there used to be this sort of three-month line, right? It's like until you've been doing the single bell stuff, three months. And it's like, I guess that's not the worst recommendation in the world, but it always, always seemed a little bit arbitrary to me. So when you're working with clients and people who are you know, uh, utilizing kettlebells, what do you what do you consider when we're we're talking the the single kettlebell stuff, goblet squats versus double kettlebell stuff, front squats, all that all that jazz? There's really only three double exercises I actually teach and use, and that's the the double clean, the double press, and the double kettlebell front squat. And really, the 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 biggest issue on those three is the clean. Uh, that has to be it. It it's not a natural movement for people to do. It is, it is, but the idea of starting it in the V, uh, sitting back, accelerating the bell into the zipper, and then quiet elbows popping it up to here, uh, most people, and it's it's not wrong, but when, when people come from the uh, barbell world, like me, you just want to do way too much stuff. And that's why I try to make it clean. I've written an article or two about it. You know, the Olympic... The Olympic clean is a great movement, but you've got to get the elbows out of the way. You've got to get the wrists in the right place. The kettlebell clean is one of the simplest movements I think we have in our world. And But it's kind of hard to undo all that elbow whip and shoulder stuff, right? So really, if you pin your, if you pin your elbows to your side, pin them, you probably make a perfect kettlebell clean. If we put... <laughs> I don't know if you could do it, but we threw some kind of strap around you or something like that. It would probably make you clean very well. Um, so for me, I like to move up to the, to the doubles, especially with the press, as soon as I can get that double kettlebell clean, Todd. So there, there's my line in the sand. And by the way, uh, Patrick, it could be very quickly. I, yeah, uh -huh. I agree. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not a big fan of double kettlebell swings. I, 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 I can't stand double kettlebell snatches. I think the, I think that's a ticket to uh, surgery personally. Right. Uh, uh, I just not a fan of them. Um, it's hard to see. It's hard to see what, I mean, if you're doing them, you know, lighter at some point, a complex maybe there, but 
Maybe the complex. It's, 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 it's hard to see what you're going to get out of that that you couldn't already get out of heavier double belt uh, kettlebell swings or cleans. Like what's the, what's really the marginal utility there versus inherent like, risks? My, um, my fear always with double things over your head, if something bad does happen and you have to move, you've got load coming down on your head. And I'm just, yeah. and again, uh, it's, this is just one of those things. Any, anybody who disagrees with me, teach it to 65, 14 year old boys and get back to me. Get, get back to me and you tell me, if you have a system you can teach 65, 14 year old boys, the kettlebells, double, the double kettlebell slanch, call me. I, I, I'm joking, obviously, because the, the, they wouldn't. Oh boy. Would you know, teaching, and this is, I mean, this is such an important point for coaches. A, a lot of fitness professionals, most, you know, they're, they're probably used to working with somebody one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but when you teach large groups, Dan, as I know you have for many years, I have a lot of experience teaching large groups as well, many different groups. Um, it gives you a whole different set of experiences and perspectives on things. Well, what it does, it teaches you, for example, I mean, I'm very big about really, you know, while an athlete, a person is performing the movements, I probably, I mean, outside of just things like good job, that looks good, you know, stuff that takes no brain power to process for the person, I, I probably would stay tall, uh, squeeze. I mean, there's just, there's very, very few terms I use uh, stay tall and squeeze are probably the big ones. Uh, and, and you stay tall. Oh, and go, 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 go. <laughs> I used that this weekend with, uh, we were doing lift and sprints. That's what you do. Goblet squats followed by sprints. And <laughs> someone kept noticing you say, go, go, go a lot. Well, tell me something else I can say that they're going to have time in the 0.2 seconds of transition to understand, um, you know, uh, I mean, maybe I could ask them a, you know, an Aristotelian uh, ethics question. You know, let's. Uh, yeah. So, when you're working in big groups, one of the first things you realize is that you're going to have. You're going to have to be able to coach, to a to a huge range. I mean, a vast range. So you'd better have terms and uh, uh, cues that are hit exactly. Push your knees out with your elbows. Uh, Patrick, you're not pushing, you're pushing your inner thigh out with your elbows. Oh, Billy, that's not your elbows. Oh, um, <laughs> stay, you know, and it just becomes part of what. Right. Teach it to me like I'm five and not just the cues, but the exercises themselves as we have this greater range now. So we need, um, we need extension, not just comprehension. We need something that's going to help us cover that greater range of experience levels and abilities. And that's where we might say, okay, there's certain exercises that in an isolated individual context might make sense. We can handle the nuances, manage risks, but with this population sample size, it no longer makes the cut. Right. And it forces a sort of efficiency on us. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, um, my friend, uh, Brandon Rarick just came out with a new book and, uh, you know, I was reading through it again, coaching rules and, <clears throat> and one thing is it funny i actually disagree with him on a point i think when you're in uh, not good uh i think when you're in a big group that you should make up weird names for things because you're trying to chunk more information at once that's why i like stupid names for things but you know um one time in a football game i saw the defense doing something and i yelled out uh to our quarterback west special and he went, West Special, West Special. At the line of scrim scrimmage, he yelled out, West Special. And the wide receivers and running backs all moved into different positions, and we ran a play. Well, the reason I say that, when you're working with big groups sometimes, you need to clump, clump large pieces of information. That's why I'd have a workout. I'd say, okay, today, guys, we're going to do the three amigos. Well, for those who've been around a couple of months, they knew that the big 555, they knew the three amigos, uh, these were workouts. And by saying three amigos, I'm going to tell you real fast what that was, okay? Real fast. 
Please, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Bench press with chains. I checked that. Front squat with chains. Bench press with chains. Uh, either power snatch or power clean. And the rep scheme was three, two, one, three, two, one, three, two, one. So you went front squat, bench press, snatch for threes, then front squat, bench press, snatch for twos, bunch, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, for ones. And then if that was easy, you would add weight. Of course, I'd always start off light and try to go up. Three, two, one, three, two, one, three, two, one, three amigos, three exercises, three, two, one, three, two, one, three, two, one usually three rounds going to slightly heavier. And all I did with the group of 45 to 65 year old uh, people, three amigos. So that to me is a cluster or clump. You, you see, yeah, I clumped the knowledge there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't say I disagree, you know, vehemently with Brendan. I, I think his point was valid. He doesn't like things like Bulgarian split squat. He likes the, the you know, rear elevated, uh, lunch or something like that uh, which is fine you know it's his argument that he just wants us to be consistent across the entire industry of what we call things is that or, or I, I think his point there is that so when you're reading the workout it's not all jargony but mm. to me i mean just because maybe i coach football for so long uh the jargon has its own magic too and i would argue the jargon is is inevitable you you brought up the idea of kettlebell ease and yeah. Jar yeah, and of course we, we need to introduce people to jargon. So you can't just use jargon if people don't know what they're talking about, but the jargon is there as a sort of eventually a, a, a shortcut, right? It, it captures yeah. something in a more efficient way that, that isn't captured by our general language usage. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's why, that's why, you know, people say in, in all different areas of, of, of study, um, how jargony it is. And sometimes we'll go through this great effort to get rid of the jargon. I've tried to do it myself, but then they just find themselves bringing it back in again. You know right. I mean? well, <laughs> yeah, it's funny as football coaches at the end of every season, I think it's really a good idea to write down all the lessons. You learned. By the, I always tell school teachers in April, get out a piece of paper and write all the lessons you've learned this year. Interesting. I used to get into the twenties on this. Here's a good example. You don't require term papers in the last two weeks of a, uh, of a semester or quarter. If you're going to have a term paper, which I don't, then of course I stopped requiring them. I moved to much different things. But the reason is you don't want to be writing finals, grading finals, doing grades, grading term papers all at the same time. And But if you don't write that down, August comes around and you're like, oh, yeah. I'm going to have term papers at the end of the set. No, no, you're not. No, you're, you're uh, at the end of football season, you write down because what happens is you get around spring training and you will make again, the same mistakes you made last year because you forgot to write them down. Um, it's interesting. Well, it's, it's a coaching story. I don't want to bore you too much, but um, you make decisions sometimes in the off season that are not right in the heat of the season. Um, remember one time Paul Northway came to practice. He was a sophomore. Uh, he was the boy I talked, he was my student last week, right before I came on. Uh, and he didn't like the fact that I had changed some things over the summer. And he said, you keep changing things. And it's funny, I look back on the changes I made. I made those changes, you know, uh, they weren't battle tested changes. They were, oh, this might be a good idea, changes. Uh, it's just an interesting thought, yeah. It is, like, yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that, you know, every once in a while, the blind squirrel finds a nut, as we say, right? And those 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 untested um, changes can become tested in, um, in a positive direction, for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, if you go back to the uh, kettlebell world, oh, about 2007, 8, 9, uh, especially when everybody was trying to do uh, one up each other, you know, if I, you know, at my cert, um, this new ex thing called the Viking warrior conditioning had come out. And so our graduate workout was 25 minutes of snatching because 20 minutes was what they told us. And then one of the, one of the people said, Let's do five more for, you know, for Pavel. 
And I, I talked, and later, you know, in my evaluation, I said, this was one of the stupidest things I've ever done in my life. Nobody could even hold on to the bells because their hands were so destroyed. And the assistants were walking around spraying suntan lotion on your face. <laughs> you might as well just bring it. Like if you're going to make it hazing, fair enough. But like, just bring out the tasers then. And yeah. just. And what's funny is that Pavel took me aside probably not long after he said, he agreed it was the stupidest thing he'd seen in his career. But what happens is, uh, oh, you can jump off a four foot bench. I can jump off a six foot bench. Oh yeah, I can jump off a 26 foot bench. And uh, we tend to do that in our field a little bit. And that's probably not good thinking. Yeah, the, it, I mean, general one-upmanship, right? You always, you always run into it. Um, I remember those days. I do. By the way, if you can't say anything about it, uh, no worries. But if there, I know last episode you talked, you you mentioned how you and Pavel were discussing a few things. Are there any more developments on that front that it might can be, be disclosed? I didn't. I don't have anyone's permission, but hey, you know, uh, yeah, we are uh, rewriting Easy Strength. Oh, fantastic! Here it is, breaking on the Pat Flynn show, uh, ladies yeah, and gentlemen. I, uh, Love it. That's awesome. You know, <clears throat> Pardon me. For the last 10, 11 years, 12. Actually, to be honest with you, 16 years. <clears throat> I have been, you know, I've been taking the easy strength concepts and I've, I've done, I have a whole thing on fat loss. I have a whole thing on Olympic lifting um, uh, for general, for just general life and stuff. Uh, I have used it for an athlete. Uh, she threw uh, one of the farthest marks in American history doing easy strength. And of course, didn't trust it after that, which still makes me laugh. Uh, <laughs> if you throw really, really far and you're a thrower, it's probably good. Uh, but people don't trust easy strength. You, you follow? It oh, weird. yeah, I know. I know. Because it's always, okay, um, all right, I'll, I'll do this. But can I also do X, Y, and Z? That's the, the most easy common, strength. right? Okay, easy strength. It's always easy strength. Plus, which implies exactly what you're saying. It implies that they don't think that easy strength is in and of itself right. going to do the job. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of areas that have helped, and I'll be, I don't want to blow smoke up here, but uh, the, the idea of pirate maps is very helpful uh, to work with an easy strength mindset. Uh, Tim Anderson's original strength is to me uh, a jigsaw puzzle piece with easy strength. It fits perfectly. Um, so <clears throat> I've come, yeah, uh, I guess I'm about to say I've come a long ways, uh, and that's true, I have. Uh, but uh, certainly listening to other people, uh, the, in, the, the impact working with the military communities on their feedback. Uh, and the funny thing about their feedback is uh, they have a hard time doing it with the command. They almost have to train by themselves because everybody else is wondering, you know, you know is you know, little Billy working out? Well, yeah, I am. And I'm making great progress and I feel good and I sleep better. And my concussions are better. Oh, okay. But it's hard to, it's hard to put your mind around. Um, there, and by the way, <clears throat> there's nothing new about easy strength. Uh, it's basically what Hackenschmidt uh, recommended to uh, Percy Cerruti, Cer uh, uh, Percy Cerruti. Um, five exercises, train intensively and get out. You're, you're done. You know. So, um, is this um, so you're rewriting Easy Strength, which is which is great news. Are there any uh, any other teasers you can give us? Any expected release dates or anything along those lines? I know I'm asking for a lot here, Dan, but it's exciting news. Well, right now, um, I just finished rereading it, the original, and then I put together kind of like a, a basic format of the new stuff. And then I kind of came up with some vision. I think we're going to keep a lot of the original. Uh, obviously, some things need to be cleaned. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of all the pictures in the original. And, and the pictures are great. I mean, it's nice to see everybody I know in their pictures. But um, it sometimes the pictures were distracting to what was being, they didn't fit with the topic. Sure. Mm -hmm. One of the things, um, there's a few things from uh, Pavel. I'd like to have him in there. One of the things is this, uh, I'd like to have a chapter called the skill of strength. 
that was something I'd like to have. Um, I, I, I turned over my idea to Pavel, but if he doesn't want to do it, I still think I, I will. Because <clears throat> um, folks, when I say the skill of strength, um, part of it goes back to my, my work on tension in my book, Now What Goes Through This to Death. But this is the reason I always start with planks at a workshop, the push-up position plank, um, the bat wing or the isometric pull, the glute bridge or hip thrust bridge, the goblet squat and the farmer walk. Because tension, learning tension is the key to being strong. So when I, even, it's funny, I'm out, in, I'm out here yesterday, and, you know, it's 32 degrees and I'm outside snatching. And what was funny is that I'm 63, it's 30 degrees, you know, uh, by the way, just warm enough so I didn't have to wear bar uh, gloves, which is always nice when I'm Olympic lifting. Uh, there are times with the bar, uh, my hands start to stick to that damn thing, which is not a good thing. Uh, never let go is a bad way to Olympic lift. <laughs> um, but what was interesting is even even as I was reviewing the lifts it was like it's strange how I have that ability to set my heels set my uh, lats set my lower back you know push my uh, try to spread the floor I, I do all those without even thinking about it mm -hmm. so the skill of strength is teaching someone tight grip set the ab wall, you know, brace the ab wall, uh, set the lower back, break pencils with your, uh, you know, where your, where your triceps and lats uh, meet, you want to try to break a pencil or a finger that's stuck in there and you just go up there and then you push the floor away and then whip that weight overhead. Well, that's moving with tension. Uh, that's explosive tension and, that skill takes a lot of time to learn. Yes, it does. And so to me, the skill of strength is going to be a major part of, 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 of that's why easy strength works, by the way. Right. I, I mean, I would imagine Pavel would be receptive to that because that seems completely in line with his philosophy, at least from all the stuff of his that I've I've read before. You know, strength <clears throat> is a skill. It's it's we approach, I mean, it's it's practiced differently. Uh you know, in practice and how you would approach a musical instrument or the craft of writing, but it's still something that requires a lot of deliberation, uh, especially over technique, repetition, refinement, review is another important part of the, of the skill development process. Mm -hmm. But Patrick, with a musical instrument, you get that instant feedback when it's wrong. See, it sounds wrong. Well, I, 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 see, that's an interesting thing because it sounds wrong to somebody with a very trained ear, but I've taught enough people that sometimes – so I'll, I'll, I'll definitely grant you that it's, it's more obvious when something is wrong, I think, with a musical instrument to most people than it is with exercise technique. But if you follow my point, you can still make a deadlift with horrific technique, and the feedback is you made the lift. Right. Mm -hmm. But down, down the road here – that those reps are going to wreck you. Right. You know, I would say that there is a parallel there with, with, um, with music, even on a guitar, like you could hit a G note with bad technique and you'll be able to get away with it. Um, you know, starting out, but once you get to the more technical stuff, if that technique isn't dialed in, uh, -huh. uh you're going to fly off the rails. You're never going to be able to pull it off. Um, so I think there is, uh, there's both, uh, a similarity and a dissimilarity in the sense that I think people can probably get away maybe for longer uh, with uh, bad technique and exercise without initially noticing it. Um, but good. even, yeah, but even in music, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just because this is something I had to do. I mean, for the first, um, this will bore people, but I, I say for the first three years of my guitar career, I held the pick wrong. I just held it wrong. And I did, I could do most of the stuff I wanted to do by holding it wrong. I could hit the right notes, get the sounds I wanted. And I started to get to more technical stuff, faster stuff, more precision. My guitar instructor said, no, this, you, you got to go back to square one because, because you've ingrained this bad technique habit and now it's caught up to you finally. So I could get away with it for a certain period of time. And that was a hugely frustrating and painful process. Because I had to not only develop a new habit, but I had to get rid of a really bad one. 
that that was ingrained for for years that really just put a hard stop to to how much i was able to progress well that's why i like thick bar deadlifts because i don't have to teach a tight grip Mm -hmm. Uh, so much of so much of the you know it's like it's like when you use a balance beam the example i love is uh, when i was in southwood junior high every day we had to do an obstacle course and the third thing in there was a zigzag balance run and if you fell off you had to go back to the start well no one ever had to tell you you fell off Mm. (laughs) because you know you knew what with the thick bar, if you're using the C or what I call the Raptor grip, the C grip, if I put, if you put your hands on it, you, you'll instantly figure out that you can't just jerk the weight off the ground. You'll instantly figure out that you have to squeeze your lats because you have to help your grip. Yeah. And so sometimes, um, sometimes the tool will actually be part of the teaching, uh, uh, teaching cl- uh, group. Yeah, that's that's a good. You know, and just to to give another example this is it's it's this is why not just having a coach but having the right coach is so important so my first guitar instructor didn't correct me when he should have because i guess he thought that it was just good enough and to give an example i would hold the pick with too many fingers and then i could hit you know a certain amount of notes and chords but there was too much tension that when i started to try getting faster and faster it was it was self-limiting and it wasn't until i moved and i got a new coach who said all right this isn't going to fly anymore so it wasn't that I didn't even have a coach. It's that I had a coach who was letting me get away with something that he should have never um, allowed me to do. Well, that's mm-hmm. one of my favorite parts, if you don't mind me, of Derek Sivers' book. Uh, I think the book is called What Do You Want or something like that. He does exactly the same thing. If, if what your, your, your guitar instructor did. I, I like this. So his whole point is um, <clears throat> when you're starting a project, uh, these are certain questions. Uh, you're going to have, you want to have a website up in six months. Okay, good. I want the website up in six days. What's going to be different. And then uh, he just, uh, six years. Okay. You can't have a website up for six years. What would you do? And you just keep playing around with the time and then, okay, you're going to set up a website without a computer. What are you going to do? And I love it. It's, it's my favorite part of the book because it, it feels more like the life I've led. Okay, uh, Danny, you're now the head sophomore football coach. What's that mean? It means you have 60 boys uh, of which eight are athletes, 10 are hardworking, and the rest just want to have a uniform on. Goodbye, thank you very much. So so what happens is, okay, and then when you become the junior uh, varsity coach, okay, Danny, uh, here's the team. Uh, I only have, there's only 13 here. Yeah, that's all you got. Um, we don't have any linebackers or running backs. Yeah, good luck. See you tomorrow. You know, see you after you come off in the game. And I love that. I love coaching those extremes mm-hmm. because it kept making me think uh, out, outside a little bit. So um, I want a whole body workout, Patrick, with no equipment. I want a whole body workout with a machine only. I think both of us can answer that, right? You I know? hope so. I hope I could do that. Yeah. yeah. But I just, no matter what equipment issue you have, I think I can overcome it because it's not about the equipment. Right. It's about the, the, the more important. And I like this. If you don't mind the, the Derek Sivers kinds of thinking and shout out to you, Derek. Thank you. I yeah. Love- what's the name of that book again, real quick, just for people. I think it's called what, what do you want? Uh, hang on. I'll, I'll, I'll I will look it up for you because I am wonderful. We always like to give a reading recommendation or two on this podcast. And, and, uh, the person who recommended this book to me was Brian uh, Gwaltney, the guy who uh, runs my site. And uh, I can't believe anything you want is the book. And then his anything follow-up up, and his follow-up book, which I really liked a lot, was um, Hell No, wait, Hell Yes. And I, I can't seem to find you now. Are you still there? Me? Oh, there you are. I'm here. Sorry, I lost you. So <clears throat> his idea is um, once you get to a certain place in life, there's only one way to respond to a yes, no question. Either hell yes, can't wait to start, or no. Yeah, yeah um, I like that. That's cool. 
Yeah, and for me, uh, I know when I'm doing things right is when I wake up at night and think about it and I'm excited. And he basically says the same thing too. I like that. Love it. Fa fantastic and, and great dis discussion as always, Dan. I know we went a little bit longer than usual, but I think it was worth it. Shall we, shall we, shall we field a question or two here? Yeah, and by the way, one once less, uh, li gentle listeners, that haiku thing was as fun to review as anything. Thank you all for what you did. I'm, I'm still getting them. People are still sending them in. <laughs> and here's the funny thing, gentle listeners. That haiku you wrote, put it up on your wall. I'm not talking about the poetry of it. It's probably the answer to all, all your questions. You know? Right, yeah. So if you still sent the haikus in, I see you. Um, maybe we'll um, maybe we'll, we'll read a few of them in a future episode. So good. <laughs> Um, all right, so this first question comes from a gentle listener, Kurt, uh, K-U-R-T, and uh, he says, Hello, Pat and Dan. I am a personal trainer and a lifetime learner. I am currently grabbing books by all the people in the health and fitness industry that I respect very much. I do not just read the books like most people. I dissect them, write down notes, and compare those notes with other books I have read. Okay. I like to absorb the information, not just read it. I am currently uh, reading Becoming the Supple Leopard by Dr. Kelly Starrett for the second time. I'm purchasing Functional Training for Sports by Michael Boyle and Fitness or Fiction by Dr. Brent Book Brookbush. So here is my question since I want to dissect a book and read it multiple times. What is a book you would suggest for a lifetime learner uh, by Dan John? 40 years with a whistle or now what? Or something else? P.S. I took your advice that you gave me on a past podcast on taking my kettlebell swing out of my assessment process and adding in balance and hang work. Thank you very much. I appreciate the advice more than you will ever know. So, Dan, that sounds like a long way of asking what Dan John book you think is most appropriate uh, for Kurt here. Well, don't you love questions that always set you up to just promote your own stuff? Well, as I now what is is a good book for. You know, can you go, so the three books, Intervention, Can You Go, Now What? Those are my teaching books. Those are the books that would be like, okay, you want to be a performance coach. You want to help someone, you know, ride a bicycle. Here's the three books. This is uh, basically how I put together weightlifting. Uh, though you'll notice in Intervention, I have changed a few things. We keep discussing about putting those three books into one. And I really should do that, but I have to hire somebody. I, I can't read my own work. But 40 years with the whistle, uh, Kurt, is going to be, so it starts off with my basic 10 commandments of coaching. Um, I've upgraded a little bit. You'll find it in attempts. But then it's that whole thing of my mentors and where I learned what. Uh, and so it'll give you a, a chance to see why I think the way I think uh, versus just, uh, and then finally, uh, it's my more up-to-date thinkings on things like uh, snapacity and how I look at the movement matrix. Um, so I think 40 years would give you the best vision of things. Um, you know, a couple of the books you mentioned, and in fact, we go on to a lot of books, you know, I, there are a lot of books out there. I don't like, you know, uh, Pavel and I were having this great conversation about a week or so on the phone. And one of the things I was pushing against when we came out with easy strength was back in, 2010 11 or so we had gone from being insane so remember everyone was trying to kill each other in seven eight nine well in 2010 no one could walk up a flight of stairs and so correctives took over um 2010 uh the the workout that shall not be named uh was taking over fitness and within about an 18 month period jacking up every single person who did it so correctives had taken over. I don't know if you remember this, Pat, but you'd mm -hmm. be at workshop and you'd have people doing, you'd be seen at the constantly, uh, if you can't see me, if you're listening, I'm doing weird things with my wrists right now. It is. The, the pendulum just really just swung from one extreme to the other in the course how of like one we, or two how years. How do we uh -huh. kill everybody to, oh, I, someone posted not long ago that they are certified, they're level two certified in a mobility thing which makes them experts on the neurological system. And I thought, no offense, dude, if, if I have a neurological problem, I'm going to go to someone called a doctor, not to somebody who's <laughs> been to two weekend certs. Yeah, friends, I have my level two 
movement screen as well. I will tell you very um, confidently, I am not a neurological expert. Wow. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just not. Uh, so Kurt, yeah, I recommend 40 years because, uh, you know, it's, and the thing is, somebody said you shouldn't write your autobiography yet, Danny. And I'm like, it's not an autobiography. It is, I think the way I think because of Ralph Maughan, Dick Knottmeyer, Dave Turner, you know, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. I don't, I don't think out of a, you know, my experiences have made me the person and coach I am today, good or bad. I and mean, there are days where I'm not a good person um, and I'm working on that. So yeah, thank you, Kurt. Great question. <clears throat> um, a lot of people read my books and they say he's, he's talking about the same thing again. And then one day they realize that, yeah, I'm talking about the same thing. And maybe that same thing's pretty damn important. Right. Out of curiosity, Dan, if you were just to meet somebody completely random on the street, you didn't really know anything about him. You just had to give him one of your books, the book that you felt was just, I guess, most likely to make the best overall impression. Uh, you know, the new one attempts. And the only reason is, is because I, I, I wrote that book in a much more friendly 2020 style. Mm -hmm. uh, the, everything's, everything's a lot shorter. Uh, it's a bathroom book, but it is in order. Um, a bathroom book, um, you know, the idea of not, uh, um, that great, uh, the big chill where the guy writes for People Magazine and he says, every article has to be the average length of America's bowel movement. Uh, and uh, so I got good advice about my writing. I write too much. I Sadly, I come, I have a very strong education. And so I don't have the problem with reading something that's more than a page and a half. But according to my readership, they want- And that is a problem. If that, if you cannot read something that is more than a page, that is a problem. You need to work on that. So that would be the book I would recommend. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Beautiful. All right. Uh, let's see here. Um, what do you think, Dan? Can we squeeze one more in? Please. Yeah, sure, of course. All right. Um, gentle listener Eric says, hey, Pat, question for both you and Dan. I've heard both of you talk about not programming heavy back squats. And I believe Dan has actually mentioned regretting programming them for athletes in the past. I'm curious why you guys seem to feel strongly about staying away from heavy squats. I could that. just be, I could just be misinterpreting that both of, of what both yeah. of you have said, but I'd love to hear you elaborate on when and for whom you feel heavy squats are beneficial or not beneficial. I personally have benefited from squatting heavy and like a lot of young guys was able to build a lot of strength or mass very quickly in my twenties with heavy squats. Thank guy. Thanks guys. Keep up the good work. Not trying to start an argument about squats. We'd just love to hear you guys elaborate. Hey, feel free to argue with us at any time. We're not, we're not scared of, <laughs> of arguments at all, but no, this is good, Dan. All right. Why don't you, uh, why don't you start this one? I mean, if you read mass made simple, it's a six week program based on, Heavy back squats. Uh, the, <clears throat> the issue is this. I, I was hearing this. I was hearing this even in the 1970s. <clears throat> Sorry about this this morning. Um, Vasily Alexiev, the great uh, Soviet uh, super heavyweight, first person to clean a jerk 500, ended up cleaning a jerk in 564. Just, you know, amazing lifter. He had this belief that anything that was 10, squatting over 10 kilos of your best clean and jerk just didn't have any value i remember reading that that's 22 pounds so for me my best clean and jerk was 385 so that puts me right around what 405 my best clean is 402 so we can slide that up if you want and say okay 425 when i was squatting 385 405 low 400s um my squat helped my athletic performance Go to the Olympic Training Center. They tell me I got to get off this high protein diet. They put me on a high carb diet. I got up to 273. My back squat went 605 for three, and my throwing went downhill. I threw less as a thrower, which is terrible, of course. And it wasn't, it, here's what I'm, uh, Eric, what I'm always trying to say is this when it comes to conditioning, there's enough, and then there's more. And more is just more. When it comes to back squat loads, 
there's enough to help propel you towards your goals. And then there's more, and then there's more, and then pretty soon your squat is getting in the way of your other goals. Now, if you're a power lifter, of course, you've got to squat heavy. But if you're not a power lifter, more is just more. And one of the problems with the back squat is almost universally you can figure out a better a, a way to add more load. Bigger belt, bigger knee wraps, a squat suit, uh, wearing the tightest pair of Levi's you can find, uh, squatting with less and less depth, which is what I see most common, uh, having your spotter help you pull it up as you stand. Um, and then you're starting to chase this number. Eric, you're starting to chase this number, but you're missing, why am I doing this? Okay. And that's the issue, Eric. And it's, it's, and it's important that you, 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 you throw your arms around that intellectually and say, okay, what Dan is saying is squats, back squats have an important place, especially in hypertrophy, bodybuilding, increasing mass. But then there becomes a point where increasing load no longer has the impact outside of powerlifting that you want for your athletic career. You know, remember, Tom Platt's made his best progress when he was uh, squatting 405 for four sets of 20. Uh, I mean, 405 is not very heavy, but just do tw four sets of 20 and get back to me on the mass. Once you get, if, if you're not gaining mass, four sets of 20 with 405 in the back squat, you, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> Something else is going on. That's good. Um, I don't have a whole lot to, to add to that, but I'll maybe talk more about that on, a, on another episode later this week. As for now, Dan, uh, thank you as always for your time, but give us a uh, number of quick updates before we go. Um, what's coming down the pipeline over at Dan John University? Anything else you want to uh, put in the listeners' ears before we say goodbye? Well, my friend Brian has added optional workouts now. So now we can put in and do single workouts for the generator. For example, if you're at a hotel... Or if, you know, for example, right now, um, you, for the next two weeks, your gym is closed down. You've been doing this wonderful workout at your gym. So now you can just look around the house. And, okay, so for two weeks, I'm going to do, you know, work out with furniture slides and uh, and a stick. So, the, you know, so it's very, it's a nice little addition, which I think is really great. And he's also added challenges and um, I announced at the site that I'm going to be doing the 10,000 swing challenge in January. Mm. I'm just going to have to figure it out how to make it with, uh, make it work with my home training because, uh, Mike Brown has no interest in doing the 10,000 swing challenge. So I might have to roll out of bed early and do the 500 swings by myself every day. Uh, I will, I was actually thinking about doing it on, uh, Instagram live and, uh, and you know, if people want to join me, I mean, that'd be kind of fun. I mean, that would be sweet. Dork, dork, mm -hmm. dorkiest. I mean, if <laughs> T Tiffany always quotes uh, Farmer Ted from Sixteen Candles, uh, that her husband is the king of the dipshits. You know, uh, Dan. At some point, we'll have to do a dual because you can have the dual Instagram live. We'll have to do some type of joint routine or workout. That'd be fun. I mean, I'd be willing to set it up. It's real simple here. Um, in my, uh, I have more military gigs coming up, but then after Thanksgiving, things gets quiet again. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do for Thanksgiving. Uh, after the election, uh, they refused to do anything in Utah. Uh, we are now, we now have the highest rate of infection of COVID in the nation. Uh, we are, our, our ICU units are crowded. I found out the other day that my friend who died was put in a hallway to die. Uh, because they had run out of space and they needed. And that's, you know, what bothers me is that I'm a great believer in the absolute dignity of the human person. That's kind of one of my, one of my pillars. And right. It kind of hurts my heart a little bit to find that a friend of mine not only had to die alone, but he had to die alone in the hallway mm. because they didn't have space. So wear your mask, folks. It's not political. It's the right thing to do. Wear your seatbelt. Even if it was legal to not wear it, you should wear it. Mm -hmm. Not just so that we don't have to watch you horribly die. Okay? Wear your seatbelt. And kids, drugs are bad. Good talk. Good talk. <laughs> so, Dan, um, 
I had something else that was going to pop into my mind, but as, as always, I get lost in, um, and what Dan John is saying, which is not a bad thing. And, but, um, but yeah, but things, I, things are yeah. good. I've got a weightlifting meet coming up and my body weight is not going down because, uh, uh, a bunch of issues and, uh, I might have to recalibrate what, uh, weight I'm going to come in at. <laughs> so remind us one more time. When is the actual, um, event? First Saturday, December, but I, I, right now I don't, I don't know how we can host a meet under COVID. Oh, and lifting weights with a mask on. Uh, ooh, that's going to be rough. I don't know if there's a, um, is there a virtual possibility for something like that? Or would that just be too much funny business with trying you know to. Uh, people have been doing it and it's been, so when I grew up, many weightlifting meets were called postal. Uh, and if you go to the old uh, strength and health, you'll read about the, like the Montana state postal championships where you did the work, you, you lifted and then you sent your results in. And yeah, it all had to be, you know, you had to be on the up and up and I'm sure people cheated, but uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful way to compete, especially in a sport like weightlifting, you know? Right. Yeah. If only the, if only we could go more on the honor system, that would be a uh, good for the, uh, for the time. Well, you're going to uh, lie uh, about the weights you're going to lift, you know, What's the, what's the point of doing it, right? What's honestly, what's the what's the point? But uh, good, Dan. We're looking forward to that coming up. We'll link to Dan John uh, University, all the stuff you got going down uh, over there. Be sure to check out Dan's YouTube channel. Snag a copy of the book Attempts, and uh, leave it. You know what? Leave a comment. Uh, let us know what you think. Give us some questions, and uh, I still got a few audiobook codes to give out. So yeah, uh, um, drop us a note, mm -hmm. Patrick. If you want, make a note. Maybe next week. Let's try. Uh, Let's try another poetry contest. I got some haikus. So, all right, we'll extend it. If you got some fitness poetry for us, uh, send it to Pat Flynn at Chronicles of Strength .com. We'll pick some winners. Dan John, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Pat. It was wonderful again today. Thank you. Talk to you next week. Looking forward to it, buddy.